This is the sweet sound of success with Sue Wilhite, Profit Attraction Master. Linda Sunshine West, the founder of Women Action Takers, is a speaker, six times best-selling author, mastermind facilitator, executive film producer, and red carpet interviewer. Her mission is to help 5 million women entrepreneurs share their voice with the world with her mastermind, collaboration projects, podcast, magazine, and events. She believes in cooperation and collaboration and loves connecting with like-minded people. Welcome, Linda. Thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here, Sue. This is going to be a lot of fun. You guys put your put your seatbelts on. Here we go. <laughs> right? Absolutely. And put your seatbelts on. We met, what, a week or two ago? If that, yeah. On Clubhouse. <laughs> exactly. I mean, this is, this is the great thing that I think the pandemic did. I mean, talk about the hero's journey. It's given everybody sidekicks that they didn't know they had, you know, and mentors they didn't know they had because social media has just exploded in ways and Clubhouse is one of them. And you find the most amazing people who've been out there all this time that you never knew existed. So, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because there was an interview of Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones in Rolling Stones magazine or Rolling Stone. I think it's Rolling Stone right. magazine. And right. the they asked him, so what does it feel like to be the most, to be the best guitar player in the world? And he said, I'm not the best guitar player in the world. The best guitar player in the world is in Tubelo, Mississippi. They're just not known. So it's exactly what you were saying. Like we're meeting these sidekicks, these people that we're meeting in all these different areas, but we don't know who's out there because we don't know who everybody is. So it's really great because right. we get these different opportunities to meet different people that are doing different things and really can enlighten us and open up our eyes, our minds, our heart and soul to what's really out there for us. Right. And help us along the hero's journey, you yep. know, whatever our personal hero's journey might be. And for those of you who are watching or listening, uh, this show's subtitle is The Hero's Journey for the Entrepreneur's Soul. And as such, we're going to go over five pieces of The Hero's Journey from Joseph Campbell. And those five pieces are the ordinary beginning, which still after 20 odd episodes still make me laugh. <laughs> Yes, what's ordinary, what's ordinary. exactly. What anybody is. Um, the call to action for entrepreneurship or whatever got Linda into the world. <laughs> um, the big hairy monsters that I know she has an abundance of, at least 365, if I remember correctly. Yeah. <laughs> um, the really important parts, what we were just talking about, the sidekicks, the mentors, the the friends, the allies, the, the guides, the folks that are with us to help us along in the journey. And that is so important because nobody does this alone, period. Just doesn't happen. Um, and then finally, the return home that Joseph Campbell talks about when you've been on this journey, it changes you. And other people in your life may not have changed in quite the same ways or at the same rate. <laughs> so there's always something interesting about what happens with other folks. However supportive they may be, there might be some interesting twists and turns in that. So Linda, Linda Sunshine West, yes. what was your ordinary beginning? Well, starting with uh, Linda Sunshine West, Sunshine is not my given name. It's a name that was given to me and it was only given to me within the last three years. My hero's journey actually starts six years ago. So it was three years into my journey that people started calling me Sunshine. But my ordinary wow. beginning, you know, which is it's interesting because, you know, like you mentioned, what is ordinary who's to say that my beginning really is ordinary for me. It is because it's, it's what I lived. But, you know, like a lot of people, what I'm finding is there are so many people out there who have had 
a similar experience to me with their beginnings. You know, I grew up in a very volatile, abusive, alcoholic mm -hmm. household. Um, and what that did is that caused me to become a people pleaser because I had so many fears and those fears caused me to not really live my life. However, however, as I look back on my life, when I was five years old, I ran away and I was gone an entire week. Now, the first question everybody always asks me is, where did you go? What did exactly. you do <laughs> for a week? Where, yeah. Where did you go? So I just went to the neighbor's house, but for all intents and purposes at five years old, I was gone for a week. You know, I was running away forever. Um, why did I stay gone so long? Well, I didn't like my household. My dad was very abusive. And I, I only came back because my mom knew where I was and she brought me back. But when I was there, I didn't know my parents knew where I was. So I want you to imagine you're five years old, you leave and nobody comes to get you. Was right. one of the things going through your mind? They don't love me. They don't want me around. I was right. I knew it. And so unfortunately for me, that, that thought of they don't love me, they don't want me around, it stuck with me until I was 51 years old when I hired a life coach. Now that's part of my journey, but that's not the beginnings, sort of back, back to the beginnings. Um, right. you know, so, so anyway, I ended up having a lot of fears. Um, I became, I was a people pleaser really to the max. I said yes to everybody, which means I'm saying no to myself all the time. Right. And, you know, through, through this journey, I ended up my first marriage. I married somebody just like my dad. I had uh, two kids with my first husband. We were together two years, two kids. And when I walked out on him, my son was 14 months old and my daughter was four weeks old. She was wow. in a baby carrying thing. And I put him on my hip, a diaper bag and a purse over my shoulder. And I literally walked out. I didn't have a car. So I literally wow. walked out. So look at how like brave and strong that was. But here's the thing. I didn't see myself as brave and strong. I saw myself as full of fear. I was running away. It's right. not that I was like, I am woman, hear me strong. You know, I, I, that wasn't it. I was like, oh my God, I'm so scared. I'm going to live this life. I'm going to live the same life my mom lived. And right. that's why I left was because of the fear that I had of living that life. And I spent so many decades living in fear, running away from things for fear that this would or wouldn't happen. So that's like the ordinary beginnings. <laughs> right. And so that fear, I'm guessing, uh, because it tends to be the classic mythical call to action is some kind of fear that, that drives you along. So what was the call to action? Well, for Besides me, all uh, the actions that you took <laughs> yeah, running there away. Were, I mean, that that's, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there were actually lots of actions. And again, as like, I look in, at, back at my life and I say, I did a lot of, I did a lot of things that looked like, boy, you're, you're brave. You're strong. You know, on the outside, I had 49 jobs in 36 years. So wow. You think about that, just that alone, that means I had at least 49 interviews, right? At least. So I had 49 that I nailed and got the jobs. And, and but the, why did I have so many jobs? Well, again, I was actually always running away from something. I was never running to something new or something better. I was like, I'm sick of this. I'm just going to go. And a lot of people, they will live their life sick of something, right? Just because that's what it is. And so looking at that, the strength that I had it's interesting because I didn't feel, again, I didn't feel like I was strong. I didn't feel like I was brave. I felt like I was just fed up. I felt like I wanted to get out of there and I wasn't going to do that anymore. Like I was not going, I told my mom you know, at one point, she was like, you can't get divorced. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I said, I, and it was not nice of me to say this, but I was like, I'm not going to repeat your life, you know? And I took a stand right. for myself, but I was again, running away. But yeah. now I look at it and I see how brave and strong I was. But at the, at the time I was, was living it, I didn't feel brave and strong at all. Right, right. Because those weren't the models that you had of being brave and strong. Brave and strong was, you know, Wonder Woman going and kicking somebody's butt and, you know, yeah. doing that. Oh, sort of mighty thing. ISIS. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and my name is Linda with a Y. So Linda Carter right. was the original Wonder Woman, you know. So, of course, like, I thought Carter, I had to be like yeah. her. <laughs> well, but it was it was still brave. And I just want my viewers to understand that even if you don't have a model 
that is labeled brave doing what Linda did in leaving a, a, an untenable situation is brave. It's totally brave. There are millions of people suffering, just as you said, with mm -hmm. something that is that is making them sick, is actively harming them, and and they're not leaving. Yeah. And that's a different kind of bravery, but you know, it, it, it's safer to get out of it. <laughs> it really is. So. And you know, like for self-sanity, and I'll just share this last thing is uh, my mom was with my dad for 55 years. Mm -hmm. And we were all at the hospital and my dad, he was, he had a um, heart pacemaker and mm -hmm. he had had his very last day of life. He had had 87 heart attacks and the pacemaker helped him kick back in every single time. Right. Well, my mom couldn't make a decision. See, she had spent so many decades with my dad. My dad made all the decisions because if she made a decision, it was always the wrong decision. You made right. the wrong decision, Marge. Why did you do, you know, so there was always a lot of blame. So she couldn't make a decision. And finally, my husband, and I looked at her and said, mom, you got to make a decision. You got to tell them to, to disconnect his pacemaker so he can go, you know? And so she told us to do that. So we ended up telling the doctors and the very first word she said when he took that last breath. Now we had all the family was at the hospital. She said, and I was standing right next to her. Thank God the bastard is dead. Those yeah. were her first words. So imagine 55 right. years of that, of waiting. He had had probably a good seven or eight heart attacks in his life since he was 35, all the way till 75 years old. He had cancers. My dad, sir, he, I called him the energizer bunny because every five years he was having some major, major catastrophe happening in his body and he kept living. And my mom was just waiting and waiting and waiting for him to go. Right. right. You know, but could not make the move that would yeah. actually release him from his body. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Just paralyzed, paralyzed with fear, yes. right? Yes. Paralyzed with that fear. And you know, two weeks before she passed away, which was she passed away three years later, um, she mm. said to me, I've lived my life with so many regrets, Linda. You go out there and you live the rest of your life with no regrets. And I heard her loud and clear. And that was 10 years ago. It was exactly 10 years ago, almost to the day. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that brings us to your big hairy monsters. <laughs> and as I teased in the beginning, you've got a lot of them. So talk about some of them. Don't talk about all 365. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, what she's referring to, for those who don't know, is in 2015, I decided to face a fear every single day that year. And why would, first of all, why would I do that? And did I really have 365 fears? Like these are the two most common questions I get asked. And first, the reason I did that is in 2014, the end of 2014, I was driving to work one day. I was working for a judge in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And this was became, before I became an entrepreneur. And I was driving to work. I was like, oh my God, I just, I hate this job. It's so boring. It really was really boring. Sorry, judge, but <laughs> it was boring. And, and I was like, I just hate this. Like I hated it to driving to work. There were so many hates that I had. I had, I just had, was filled with hate and mm -hmm. I got to work that day. And on Facebook, there was a post from this woman. It said, I'm a life coach. I took some time off. I'm getting back into it. I'm looking for five women who want to change their life. And I was like, oh my God, this woman's talking to me. I didn't know her. But I reached out and I was like, I'm in, I want to change my life. I want to change my life. So I hired this life coach and I worked with her for five months until the end of like, it was November of 2014. So December, I was on my own. I worked with her for five months and it was solid. I mean, she was amazing. And I, every single week I was changing because I was really, I did my homework and I was very diligent. Mm -hmm. And um, that last month in 2014, December, I was by myself and I had didn't realize it, but I had gotten addicted to that change, that right. constant moving from a negative person to a positive person can be very addictive. <laughs> so I was very addicted to it. And so January 1st of 2015, I woke up that morning and I said to myself, I got to do something different this year because I've changed so much and I, I want to keep changing. You know what? I'm just talking to myself. You know what? I got so many fears. I'm going to break through a fear every day this year. <laughs> that was like, that was how it came up. 
So I did that. And what I did is every morning I woke up and the very first thing I said to myself before I did anything, I didn't even get out of bed is what scares me. And then I would lay in bed and I would wait until an answer came. So whatever that fear was that came to me first is the fear that I committed myself to, to working through that day. Now, fortunately, it didn't cost me anything because I, none of them were like playing, you know, jumping out of planes or eating <laughs> bugs or thank goodness. But I was like, okay, if that comes up, I'm going to do it. You know, I didn't want to, but, but my fears were so deep rooted in that fear of judgment from my childhood. You know, my, my family, there's a lot of judgment in my family and I grew up with that just tremendous, like, I can't do this because everybody will make fun of me. What if they see how stupid I am? My first husband every day for two years, solid, told me how stupid and ignorant I am. So I believed that. And I still believed it at age 51. So majority of my fears that I broke through that year were related to judgment in one way, shape or form, whether it was attending a networking event, or I was attending this one event called Secret Knock. And one of the speakers was the creator of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And my fear that morning was to talk to him, to just say hi. And so I ended up talking to him. I got a picture with him. We ended up having a conversation. Next thing you know, I'm becoming an executive film director in a film that they're writing about him called Wish Man. So it's, it's, I got to see that, you know, when we break through our fears, there's so much greatness on the other side and fears, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? They can kill you. Well, if they kill you, it doesn't matter because you're dead and you don't care. Yeah. What's the worst thing? Pretty much. Game over in the work quarters. (laughs) Yeah. So I broke through a hundred, 365 fears that year. Some were duplicative in um, the type of fear that I had related to it. What I learned to do is to recognize fear quickly and to say, oh, that's just fear. Go ahead and do it because you're scared. And that became my new mantra. Do it. I'm going to do this because I'm scared. Right. Right. That's great. Um, And I wish more people could be more as accepting of their fears. Right. It's not I'm not saying that you went, oh, I'm afraid. And so I'm going to let it rule me. But you said, oh, it's a fear. Okay. It's just a fear. Let's, let's move on. (laughs) Yeah. You know, know, one thing I, I I learned, of course, I learned a lot that year and I gained so much, um, I don't know, so much confidence that I didn't have before. And um, I created an acronym because there's a lot of acronyms out there, you know, fear, Mm -hmm. face everything and run false evidence appearing real. And I was sitting there, I was looking at those, those, you know, false evidence appearing real. I'm like, there's nothing false about it at all. I mean, fear is real. It is real. I don't care if your fear is huge or small. It doesn't matter. Fear is fear. And, and I was like, false um, evidence, like there's no evidence. And so I was like going, I was analyzing these things. And I, and I said, you know what, really what it is, is when your faith is strong, your fear is weak. So I came up with my own, and that is that faith erases anxious reactions because fear is nothing, nothing more than anxiety. Good one, huh? I think that's the best one ever. Faith (laughs) erases anxious reactions. Yeah. Okay. Because it's fear is fear is reactionary to something unknown. Fear is reactionary to something unknown. But then also, and it's, and it's anxiety, it's just anxiety um, ridden. And then when our, again, when our faith is strong, our fear is weakened. Sometimes when our faith is strong, our fear is erased. So right. that's how I came up with that. And I, and I, now what I do is when I'm feeling a fearful situation, because even though I broke through 365, I'm still human. I still have fears. And I, um, I just ask myself, Linda, how strong is your faith right now? Right. You know, and that checks me. I'm like, oh my God my faith is weak because I'm so scared. Let's just flip that. Let's have faith and let's just do it. Let's just plug that in. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Rev it up. Yeah. Why not? You know, let's see what happens. Hey, so what I failed. Guess what? I learned a great lesson. I don't see failure as failure at all. So that's one of the things I don't see. I see failure is that I, I, I took a stab at something and it didn't work. So what did I learn from that? And I'm always asking myself, even if I'm going through a situation that's not too ideal, you know, or like that's a bad situation. I'm asking myself during that situation, what am I learning right now? Right. What am right. I supposed to be learning right now? How am I supposed to have my, my mind open right now? 
And it really moves you through that situation. For me, it works to move me through that negative situation really fast. That's what I want. I want, I want to move through it fast. I don't want to hang on to it for weeks and months and years. Like I used to <laughs> waste, of, right. waste of time, space, and energy. <laughs> Not to mention, um, uh, increasing the pain factor. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want any of that. Because <laughs> I've had enough of that. <laughs> there's a ton of research that says the more that you are afraid, the more pain you experience. Oh, interesting. Okay. The, okay. So, so the more you're if, afraid, the more pain you experience. Yes. Because if you're terrified in some, you know, if you're terrified, say of surgery, or you're terrified of something hurting you, the moment that it hurts you, your, your pain experience, not, not the actual signals that are going to your brain, but the pain experience, your interpretation of that event goes up just off the scale. That is interesting. So, That's fascinating. So yeah. I I, have, yeah. Well, so I have some experiences that you're making me think about right now that um, <laughs> that exactly is what happened. Yeah. Oh, you know, it, it, it is interesting, right? Because um, there, there's people who meditate, like, like the walking on coals with Tony mm -hmm. Robbins. I've mm -hmm. never done that myself. I haven't been to his event, but it's really because they get them into a, um, like a hypnotic state of mind. And then you walk over these coals and it doesn't, there's no pain, but if you're sitting there anxiety ridden, that's going to be extremely painful. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And they tell people the more freaked out you are by the coals, the more you will be burned. And, and there's a whole host of reasons why that is true. Yeah, um, and the, and the calmer you are and the better you are, the, the more in the Zen <laughs> you are, the better, the better it is. Absolutely. Um, when, when I was in pain, uh, I suffered from a condition called dysmenorrhea when I was a, a teenager which is um, menstrual cramps on steroids. Uh, <laughs> I actually fainted a couple of times in wow. high school because the pain was so bad. You know, no gym teacher could tell me that I was just faking it because <laughs> I passed right. out. It was really bad. Um, and the technique that I developed for myself, which I found out later was actually a very useful technique, is that I would grab hold of the pain in my mind. And I would go, Oh, you call that pain. That's not pain that you're wimpy. Stop that. that the, you, you can't make it more painful. And the pain would kind of whimper and go away. <laughs> Interesting. So you talked it down. <laughs> so I talked it down. I challenged it and talked it down. And later oh. when I got hot flashes, I did the same thing. It's like, you call that a hot flash. That is isn't even an ice cube. Bring <laughs> it on. Sort of go, oh, well, no, I guess not. <laughs> You're like, bring it on, bring it on. But what it's you, facing that for me. <laughs> exactly. It's facing that, which is, you know, in front of you and causing you all that mental distress. It's the same thing. You face the fear, you face the pain and, and it reduces it very nicely. So good yeah. job. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, what's funny is uh, one of my mastermind sessions, we all went to uh, one of those cryo freeze places where you get oh, into yeah. this tank and they freeze you. And um, the first time I could only go through 25 seconds and they put you in there for up to two minutes. The goal is to get your body temperature down to like 40 or 30s, like in the thirties. And I was in there for 25 seconds and my blood pressure, sky, I've never had high blood pressure, never a problem. It skyrocketed mm -hmm. to the point that I felt like my head was going to explode. So they had to pull me out of there. And then um, I went again, like a year later, I was scared, but it was during that 2015. So I did it anyway. And I invited some friends to join me and we showed up and I said, okay, I have a different technique what I'm going to do this time. Because the first time the guy doing it, he was talking to me to keep my mind off of it, which was making me nervous. It was making me even more nervous because he was talking to me. Right. So this next time um, they had music playing in the room and it was 80s music. I'm a girl of the 80s. I love the 80s. And so they had this 80s music playing. And I said, can you turn the music up? I'm going to sing during my time. So he did, he turned the music up loud and I was singing, I was dancing inside the cryo free. I went the whole two minutes and I could have stayed in there another two, three, four minutes easily. And when I came out of there, my body temperature had gotten down to like 34 degrees. 
So I was like a success, you know, and for me, it was, I got to see the difference is that for me, mu- music is music really moves me. It's one of the yes. things that is like at my core and just by singing that music, it put me in a completely different state, a state of meditation, so to speak. And, right. and it really helped me to go through that. So it was kind of interesting how, if you find what your thing is, if it's reading, it's reading, you know, for me, it's music. You find out what your thing is and it can help you move through those situations easily. Right. Right. So speaking of finding your thing uh, to move through situations, what, who were some of the people who were your allies, mentors, guides, um, who lifted your wings and got you through some stuff? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I've been so so blessed, you know, um, at the beginning, it was my, my life coach, Liz stone. I worked with her again for five months. And then after we were done working with each other, which is the end of 2014 in January of 2015, she said, Hey, there's this vision board seminar. Let's go. And I'm like, what's a vision board. Like, I didn't know what that was. She, she told me, and she's like, let's go to this event. So we went to this event and at that event, I had no idea that that was going to be a pivotal event for me. Because what ended up happening is I ended up meeting one of my mentors at that event. Mm-hmm. His name is Greg Reed. He is um, he has this event called Secret Knock, very successful event. He's known as the Millionaire Mentor. Um, he's carrying on Napoleon Hill's work by writing some of Napoleon Hill books and things. So I really lucked out to move into this space. So we attended this event. He spoke, and I was just like, "Whoa! I never seen anybody." Well, I'd never seen anybody speak, but yeah, I never saw anybody speak like that before. So extremely motivational. And at the end of his talk, he invited this to his event, Secret Knock. And I was like, wow, that's expensive. I'm not going to go. It was $1,500 at the time and you know, for a three-day event. So my life coach, she said, I'm going to the event. You got to go. And I'm like, I'm not going to pay that kind of money. That's ridiculous. $1,500. And she said, I think I can get you a discount. So I said, mm-hmm. I'm still not going. <laughs> it's still <too> expensive. <laughs> I was used to paying $5 for an event, you know, right. not paying. <laughs> and so she looked at me in the eyes and she squared, you don't understand. You have to be there. And I said, okay, let's put it on my credit card. Let's do it. Whenever she told me I had to do something, which she didn't do very often, I knew there was something that I was missing. I knew that there was something I didn't see. And so I just listened to her and always, I always did everything she told me I needed to do. That was one of the the best gifts I ever gave myself was investing. It ended up costing me a thousand dollars, you know, to invest in that event. And there I, that's where things started to really unlock for me tremendously. That's where I met the creator of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. That's where I met the founder of Ugg Boots, who was in one of my books, I wow. met the, the inventor of the credit card magnetic strip. I'm the guy who invented the credit card magnetic strip that <laughs> nice. we use today. He's in one of my books, you know, as well as my mentor. And, and I just started meeting all these people. And that one mentor, Greg Reed, has opened the door to so many possibilities. And here's the one thing that he's taught me tremendously is he said, um, he told me that I've, I'm his best mentee ever because Aww. everything he told me to do, I did. Right. Without question. I just did it. And so every time I come back asking for more, he just keeps giving me more. So I met Les Brown, Jack Canfield. I interviewed Jack Canfield on the red carpet, this red carpet interviewing thing that I've done. I interviewed Wesley Snipes and, um, you know, Sharon Lecter. You know, I, I just so many people, uh, Mark Victor Hansen, you know, so many people that I've interviewed on the red carpet because I said yes to my life coach saying, you got to be there. It was that one yes to myself. Pivotal moment, pivotal Huge. moment, right? Yeah, yeah. I've had other pivotal moments. There's a lot of pivotal moments, but that is like the the one that opened up the biggest door. Right, right. You know? The one that allowed I, the other ones to happen. Yeah, exactly. Right. The, yeah, the like the, the ripple effect right after that. I'll share that there was one that happened before that, you know, while I was working with my life coach, that was a huge important uh, moment for me as well. And that was that I was attending a workshop for marketing and we were mm-hmm. sitting around this conference room table and um, the lady putting on the event asked a question. And for the first time I was 51 years old for the first time ever in my entire life, 
I raised my hand to answer a question. I never did that before. I was too scared. What if I say something stupid? What if they see how I, see, I had that all that was playing Judge in my head? Thing. Yeah. So yeah. I raised my hand and I was like, oh my God, what are you doing up there? Get down here. <laughs> so she <laughs> called on me and, and I, for some reason I stood up, nobody else stood up. They all sat down, but I stood up and I said, whatever it was that I said. And then, um, I sat down and I was trembling. Like my throat right. was locked up. My, I was shaking. I was sweating everything. I was just yeah. so nervous that I actually spoke out loud in front of people. And the two women sitting next to me said, that was brilliant. Can you repeat it? I want to write it down. That was that moment that I realized that I actually have value. So even though my, my dad was abusive, my first husband was abusive. The husband I have now, Scott, we've been together 32 years. He believes in me. He always has, he's always been complimentary and told me all these amazing things about myself, but I didn't believe it. I didn't believe what he was saying because I didn't believe that that's who I was. But in that moment I said, oh my God, I have value. From this moment forward, and this is what I'm saying. I didn't say this out loud. I said this to myself. From this moment forward, I will share my voice every opportunity I have because somebody needs to hear what I have to share. And that was huge. Because if I didn't do that, I would never have gone to Secret Knock. Right. Right. Yes. And everybody needs to say that. Yep. Yep. Right. Your everybody's voice is valuable. Everybody's voice is is important and Mm -hmm. needs to be heard because you don't know who it is on the other side that's listening that needs to get that message. You know, we're all divine messengers as far as I'm concerned. Um, And we don't know who we're delivering the message to. (laughs) It doesn't matter. We just need to get voices out. And that's the thing is you can deliver the message and it lands on somebody and you'll never know. And that's okay because right. you, but you needed to right. say the message. And it's one thing that, you know, I love about like coaches, like I'm not a coach myself. I don't call myself a coach. People say I am, but I don't, I just, the words overused in my opinion, but yeah. you know, for all intents and purposes, um, you know, I do coach people. And in my, one of my programs that I have is called be seen, be heard, be paid. <laughs> So many coaches, like we just want to deliver value and we forget about the part that the important piece of being paid, yes. you know, we got to be paid so we can keep on doing what we do. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yes. Because, you know, the mortgage people don't accept eggs or dairy or even, you know, a herd of cattle. Jeez, yeah, like the good old I days. Mean, yeah. You know, we've, we've come a long way, baby, but they don't yeah. accept herds of cattle anymore. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, what about what I talked about is the going home aspect, the, how is it that people view you from, you know, your, your family, um, others uh, who have known you in the past and here you are, you faced your big hairy monsters, you're doing the work, you're out there, you're, a multi best selling author, you've got all of these kudos and credits to your name. And what does your family think about all of that? Well, it depends on which family members, but I will share <laughs> that there was a period of time there, um, I guess, well, because COVID and stuff. So it was about two and a half, three years ago, where I talked to a couple of members of my family. And you know, they wanted to t- talk to me actually to tell me that they thought I was an occult. And yeah, and I thought that was very interesting. I love that statement. Yeah. They're like, we think it's a cult. And I said, you right. mean like the founder of the Make-A-Wish that has granted over 500,000 wishes to children all over the world? You mean the founder of Ugg Boots? I mean, this is a very popular product. You, mean, you, think, you think these people are a cult? And they're right. like, yeah, we don't think that they have your best interest at heart. And I said, you know what? If that's a cult, I want to be part of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Because they, they, they saw, they saw in me what I didn't see. They saw that I had a lot of value and they kept telling me that, you know, the, the cult leaders. (laughs) So so anyway, I made a decision. It was, you know, it wasn't a tough decision. It was a very easy decision. I made a decision that I was not going to talk to them 
until I had a firm, solid base. Because remember, I came from this judgmental family. And because of that, I had all these fears that I had been facing. And so I, I told them, my, it was my sisters, and I said, I'm not going to see you guys until I'm ready. And my one sister said, younger sister, she's only a year younger. And she said, but what if I want to see you? I said, I don't care. This isn't about you for right now. This is about me. This is about me having enough strength that if you say something like this stuff, that it doesn't affect me anymore. Mm -hmm. And it did, it took a year. It was a year. It was right before Thanksgiving until Mm -hmm. the next Thanksgiving. And so I called up, um, yeah, I called up one of my sisters. One of my sisters kept sending me text messages. I just never responded. I was, I was literally, I cut them off until I was ready. And it was just like a building, right? We got to build the base first. The base has to be strong so that the building can stand on it. And that was me as a human being. My mind had to be strong so that I could handle this stuff. And what I like to say is that, um, you know, it's not, I, because people say, oh, I don't care what they think or whatever. I care what people think. I just don't let it adversely affect my life anymore. There's exactly. a big difference because that's the, the power that I have is that it bounces off like, oh, that's cool. Thanks for saying that. And it just bounces off. It does not affect me anymore in a bad way. And that's what I used to do. I would hang on to that. So a year later, I reached out as about two weeks before Thanksgiving. I reached out to my oldest sister and I said, um, I'm ready. If you guys would like to have me for Thanksgiving, you know, I would like to show up. My husband and I would like to show up. And, and they were like, yeah, of course. So we showed up and it was very interesting because there was a shift and the shift, how much of it was just me and how much of it was them. I don't know, but I do know this, that there was no judgment that day, except for one thing. And I noticed it because I was not that I was trying to hear it all the time, but I, right. I'm very sensitive to judgment. I don't, I don't like it. I don't like to be like that either. I noticed it. And it was really quickly after that, that they changed the subject. And so they must've, whoever it was, you know, must've noticed that they were doing it. They changed the subject. And that was the only time there was any judgmental moment that day. And I was, I felt like, okay, you know what? I had a good time today. Most of the time I would leave and I was just like, oh God, I would just be so like, Ugh felt gross, you know, but that day I felt good. Good for you. Good for shifting the energy around your family and, and allowing them to make the shift. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's, that's a key there, right? It's because, um, because they, whether they make the shift or not, it's how do I interpret what's going on? Exactly. Exactly. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So Linda, I have one more final bonus question for okay. you. <laughs> and that is of all of the things, oh, this is an easy one. <laughs> of all of the things that you do, what is the one thing that you love doing in your business that just lights you up? It's the thing you look forward to. It, what would that be? This is an easy one for me, just like you said. And the reason for that is my life coach had me write down a list of everything that lights me up. Ah, And then what I did is I took that list. There were about 30 items on it. And I took that list and I literally poured through that list to see how can I incorporate all of these things into my business? And the thing that I do the best, I love building community and bringing people together. So you know, I host networking events as well as I run my mastermind. And it's all about, you know, how can I bring people together? You know, on Clubhouse, I like to lead clubs because I like to bring the people here. You know, so that's one of the things I absolutely love doing. I've hosted, you know, probably a good 150 to 200 events myself, you know. So it's really about bringing people together and, and you know, people with a common interest and especially helping them to grow some way, shape or form. If I can impart some knowledge that's going to help them to save time, energy and effort, then I've done a great job for the day. And I feel really good about myself and serving my purpose. I like to say, live your life on purpose, not on accident. (laughs) I lived on accident for a long time. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Well, we're glad that we've, you found your purpose. (laughs) Me too. I'm glad that you found your purpose. Thank you. <laughs> and um, 
thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your wonderful experiences. This has been a fabulous hero's journey because you, you. are a hero in your life yes. by, by all counts. You, you, know, you overcame lots of monsters. Um, you lifted up and you continue to look back and lift up you know, as you're going, it's not just, you know, about you. It's if you can light somebody else's life, you know, there you go. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank you for being on the show and thank my viewers and listeners on the sweet sound of success. Bye. Are your dreams for your business. You know what drives me crazy? Really smart business owners denying their talents because they've been taught it has to be hard, because they've been taught that they don't deserve their gifts, that they're not worth anything. They've been taught that their gender means they can't express their genius. I'm Sue Wilhite, and I want you to have access to your genius. I want you to go out and rock the world with your genius. So I created the Call to Action Coaching Program. It's all about getting to the heart of you and what you've got to share with the world to make a profitable business that thrives and allows you to make a difference in the world. Click the link to sign up for the Call to Action Coaching Program today. Don't let your genius go unnoticed.